Okay, let's go to Luke 4.18, and then we're going to move back to Exodus today. But let's at least read our text that we've been reading now for several weeks, and uh, where Jesus was handed the book of Isaiah, and he opened the book, and he says this, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me. He's been empowered to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent, he's been sent to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of those in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he said to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your ear. And I'll say it again, as I've said before, today this scripture can be fulfilled in the hearing of your ear as well. That Jesus is uniquely empowered and uniquely anointed to carry out the very things that he said. Now the last couple of weeks we talked about healing the brokenhearted. And today I'd like to move forward again and to proclaim liberty to the captives. So Jesus does not only want to heal us, he wants to free us. Amen? Isn't that good? Doesn't just heal us, he frees us. Doesn't just forgive us of our sin, he gives us power and over our sin and that we can live in freedom. Now I'm going to tell you something. It would definitely have to be in the top five of what we call predominant themes throughout the scripture and that is the story of captivity to freedom and or we could say bondage to liberty or uh, however you want to frame it but there are definitely major cycles of this theme individually with people and also corporately as with the nation I mean most people would agree that the greatest story in the Old Testament at least Hollywood thinks so is the deliverance of Israel out of Egypt and no one would probably doubt the fact that the greatest deliverance story in the New Testament is God's people being free through the cross and through the blood of Jesus right so both are very much themed what we call maybe liberation uh, liberation or from captivity to liberation freedom themes are very strong maybe I should just say it that way freedom themes are very strong in the Bible now and it's not just honestly just one maybe okay I get freed here and, and I'm good good to go no Paul said it this way in Corinthians he said look I've been delivered I am being delivered and I will yet be delivered what is he saying we're not just moving from faith to faith or from glory to glory but we are moving from freedom to freedom that liberation this the spirit of freedom is an ongoing work really within the heart of the person it is not something hey I, I got it here and that's all I need no it is a progressive work what we would call under the umbrella of salvation which one of at least one of its primary or a big big box under salvation is freedom okay healing freedom deliverance when someone says they've been saved uh, minimally they're saying they've been delivered okay so the point is this is that this is not just a some secondary priority in Jesus ministry this is ranked right up there in fact every single thing that he says here is ranked up there and has a strong history I mean so much so to just so just to kind of bring it home just a second that this idea of deliverance is so important that Jesus put it in at least the top five in how to pray, right? Not right up there with give us this day our daily bread, forgive us of our sins, and then do what? Deliver us from evil. So it is an ongoing prayer of ours to continually walk in freedom. Amen? Now, here's what I want to say to just set up now for in about 30 minutes here is that so afterwards, after this, uh, we'll take communion. But I also want to pray and have a couple of couples pray with you guys for areas of maybe things that you are desiring to be free in even today. Okay? In other words, let's t make it more than just a message. Why don't you embrace this for yourself and say, you know what, today I can experience maybe a freedom that I've never experienced before because Jesus is anointed to do so. Amen? Amen. And as I mentioned last week, the mere stepping out, making yourself vulnerable, making yourself transparent. Um, it's, it's, it's almost as though God, I mean, it does. It, he honors that. I'm just going to tell you something. When you step out, what does it say? You draw near to him, he draws near to you. 
Or how about this one? He gives grace to the humble. Okay? He opposes the proud. I mean, if you, if you want to stay proud, proud or something, then you can stay proud, but you're not going to experience grace that way. Okay? He gives grace to the humble. And, and humility is not just thinking, is not thinking less of yourself. Okay? Humility is really being open and transparent and just being who you really are, okay? No facades, no trying to be a legend in your own mind, not trying to be, you know, Joe spiritual, just a simple understanding that you stand in a place of need just like everybody else. Amen? And how you say, well, John, how do you know that? Because I've said this a hundred times, because the cross has already told me that about you. That's what he told it about me, right? The cross has unveiled that all humanity is in a place of need. Not just a few people needed the cross, and not just a few people needed a nail or two or a couple of stripes. You needed, if it was just you, just you, Joe and Sue on the planet, you needed all three nails, you needed every single stripe, you needed his beard ripped from his face. You needed the thorn of crowns on his head pounded into his head. You needed every single blow that he took to the face, every single mockery, every, every time someone spit on him, every single thing that he was subjected to, guess what? You needed it. You were not a one-nail person. You were the full crucifixion is what I need which means that it is my heart in my life that is desperately in need of Christ healing. Amen? Now, I know people have, I think they kind of think that the cross was, you know, for some really bad people because you've never murdered anyone and you've never robbed a bank. I get all that. But apart from that, the cross is for you. Amen? And when I accept that, once I accept that, and I look into the mirror, when I look into the mirror, and I accept the fact that what God says about me is true, I want to tell you something, that's where freedom begins. It really does. Because usually that's where repentance begins, okay? So what I'm saying is this, is that if you humble yourself, he gives grace to the humble. And what we need is more grace, amen? And what we need is more freedom. So I would like to just look, not as a teaching this morning, but more as an encouragement, uh, I'd really struggled, honestly, up until yesterday, because uh, it's such a huge theme, I didn't know which way to go, but I want to go to Exodus chapter 3, okay? Exodus 3, and I want to kind of tell the story, and, and I just want to encourage you that God is into setting you free. He wants to deliver you, and I wish I could just, I've, you know, I only got like 12 good stories, and I've already told those so many times here. You know, if I ever get to go anywhere else, I'll have a lot of good stories, okay? But I got to kind of repeat stories, but I can tell you something. I have at least, at certain times in my life, experienced freedom. Okay, now last week, uh, Summer gave her testimony and, and uh, you know, a sh short testimony. And, and she would tell you right now that one thing that she could say is, look, that she was this way, and she was delivered from darkness, and she was and transferred into light, right? I mean, you feel free. And I want to, can I tell you some, some, some like indicators that I don't really tell people, hey, now look, we're going to pray for you, and, and this is what you'll feel like afterwards, okay? We never, I never say that to people, but I'm going to tell you, here's some things that I've noticed. Number one, when you're free, you sleep better. You sleep better. I've noticed that. I'm, this guy, I was, I was eating dinner at a house on a Sunday, and this guy named Milton Green, he was, a, he was one of those guys that was really big into getting people delivered. And um, anyway, I just happened to have the privilege of eating dinner with him because the people that he was eating at came to our church, and so I was invited. So we're just sitting in the living room, and he, he's just quoting scripture and stuff. He's a real nice guy. And his, his claim to fame was, if you ever knew a, uh, an evangelist named James Robinson, he's still around, he's on TV some, James Robinson. James Robinson credits him for bringing him to freedom, okay? So we were sitting in the living room. Well, after lunch, we're in the living room. He said, hey, he said I'd just like to pray for you. So I'm like, well, okay. I mean, it's just me and him and one other guy. So I, we, we stand up in the living room, and he lays hands on me, puts his hand on me, and he starts praying. I'm talking about, for, I'm, I mean, things I've never even heard of before, Eastern Star, and I mean, he covered every cult, every mystical belief. I mean, he covered, I mean, he must have had a hundred things that he talked about other than just the basic stuff of the things that I struggle with. I mean, it was that and, and about a hundred things more. Just went right through it. But I'm going to tell you something. In that living room, God set me free. 
I can tell you what had happened. I was so, the burden was so lifted off of me. I didn't even know how big of a burden I was carrying. It was so lifted off of me. Here I'm in a guest house. They sent me into the guest room and I slept for hours. It was almost like I was so liberated, all my body wanted to do was just sleep. And I'm going to tell you something. The very next day, I go outside, the sky's bluer. I mean, life is just better when you're free, isn't it? Because I'm going to tell you something. Liberty is connected to the very next one there in Luke 14. I mean, Luke 4, where he says, and recovery of sight to the blind. Those two are very much connected because it's about being delivered out of a prison of darkness and brought into freedom and light. So whatever it was, just the world, honestly, the world just looks better, doesn't it? For those that have had it, don't you feel that way? I mean, it just looks better. It's not just the fact, that's how I describe it. It's not some only in my imagination that something happened or only taking it by faith, hoping something has happened. I want to tell you something, something happens. He delivers people from darkness and transfers them into light. And sometimes, if you just humble yourself, I mean, I could have told the guy, like I hear about, you know, 90% of the people say, oh, no, I'm okay right now. I really don't need it right now. I mean, that's how people say it all the time. Hey, can we pray for it? No, 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 it's all good. But it's not all good, okay? It's not. And if you just, just ask your wife, right? I mean, I, I, but truly, they probably want you to come up there for a little freedom. It's not all good, but I could have played that card. No, brother, it's all good right now in my life. You know, I'm just being led of the Lord. God's speaking to me. I could have played that card, but I want to tell you something. I'd have played that card. I'd have stayed in bondage, okay? And I want to tell you something. I I wanted that. I was telling Summer that. I wanted, she's feeling the same way right now in her life. I wanted to guard that thing so much, I was afraid to do anything. I was afraid to even go back into the place, and it was a church house, that I felt like it got on me in the first place. I wouldn't even go back to church. It was scaring me so bad. You know what I'm saying? Once you feel liberty, you want to protect it, don't you, girls? I mean, don't you? That's what I'm talking about. Jesus said, I've come to set the captives free. Why don't you just put your name there? I've come to set John free. And your name can go in there just as well, right? Right? Or is this for some other generation? I mean, Jesus carried it out. Okay, so enough of that. Let's go. I want to go to Exodus, though, because I want to look at Moses. I'm just, I don't even really have a real direction here. I'm just, as I was praying yesterday, I read the story and I got all excited. That's all I can tell you. I read the story, I got excited. Okay? And I thought, well, we'll just read it again and maybe I'll get re-excited again. Okay? <laughs> so in, in chapter 3, uh, now, here's the idea. Now, you, you get just to set it up, right? I mean, Israel, not the Jews, I should say, are in Egypt. Most of us have seen the movie. But can I say this? I'm not going to focus on it this morning, but I'm going to sow the thought in your mind for a second. Much or many of our captivities are ordered by the Lord okay it is almost I could almost say this you are destined to captivity because it is necessary for your destiny captivity the feeling of constraint confinement is honestly almost a necessary season or seasons in your life because it is in the time of captivity that God really deals with you in some wonderful ways. So what I'm saying is this, Joseph being one of those examples is that was a predestined captivity for him. He was in prison, but it was all a part of God's big plan, right? The Jews, this did not just happen, happen stance. God had ordered their path and had actually led them into Egypt, into this captivity. I would think we could say with even Paul in the New Testament, imprisoned a big part of his ministry. That was not something that caught God off guard. It was something that was ordered for him. And one thing we can get out of it is because most of the New Testament was written while he was in prison. And you and I enjoy it today. So here's what I'm saying. Sometimes God digs the pit, and sometimes he gives you the shovel to dig the pit. But the fact of the matter is, the pit is a very important part of our Christian life. 
It really is. Have you ever been in the pit? Yeah. Well, we say stuff like this, man, I'm really in the pits. I mean, you've got like lots of pits, I guess, okay? I mean, I'm in the pits. I'm, I, one is good enough for me. One is good enough for me. David said, he has picked me up. Psalms, I think, 40 or something like that. He's fit, picked me up. He's lifted me up out of the miry pit. He has set my foot, feet upon a solid rock, and he has put a new song in my mouth. Now, the miry, I looked it up. Y'all already know what it was. It means exactly what it says. Mire is just sludge mud. We've all been in that, right? I mean, not only are you in the mud, you're in the pit in the mud. You, there's nowhere to get traction. There's nowhere to be able to get some kind of leverage to get yourself out of it. Because it's the kind of mud, you know, you've been in this, right? Where you take a step and your shoe comes off. You ever been in that mud? It, it creates a suction that literally keeps you in, in it, Right? Now, some of you have been delivered from that, but you've gone right back in and wallowed like the sow. You know what I'm saying? You like the mud. But the pit is a different thing here. It's something that tries to keep you down, and it definitely restricts your sight because all you can see is mud walls. You've been in there, right? And David said he's picked me up out of that. And guess what? That new song is not something to just be like read over like that's no big deal. That new song is a new vision in your life, right? I mean, you know, what? have you ever had seasons in your life where songs meant something to you? Like when y'all were in love, you know what I'm saying? You use it in a wedding, you know, something like that. Truthfully, that's why I don't like listening to music of the past. I like that old rock and roll. I don't like listening to it because it takes me back to the past. You ever heard songs that you've listened to in the past? And it takes you back to the past, right? It takes you back. You know, if I'm on a date with Vicki, I don't want to be listening to some song that I used to like in the late 70s. When I was on a date with someone, I'd be thinking about my date when I should be thinking about her, right? Or has that only happened to me? No, it doesn't because that's just the way life works. So he puts a new song in your mouth. So that way, the old song, the thing that puts you where you were in the first place, is no longer there. Amen? Okay, so let's go back to here now. So this is just the story of God calling Moses and his heart to want to set people free. So that's what it really is. So no, now, now Moses, so here it is. So is. The Jews are in Egypt. They've been there now some almost 400 years. Moses was in Egypt for 40 years. Now he's been in the desert for 40 years. So he's now been prepared for 80 years. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Now, here's what I like. We could literally say this. He was in the back side of the desert. That's good, isn't it? Sometimes God takes you places like that, doesn't you? I think that for my life, I can honestly tell you, sometimes I feel like he's put me on the back side of the desert. But on the back side of the desert, in verse 2, is where the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Can I say this? Can I tell you what people are looking for? They are looking for something enduring. Did you know that? A fire that doesn't consume, something that is enduring, something that lasts, something that has passion to it, but it does not dissipate and come to ash. Are you with me? Something that people want something that lasts. You know, most of, a lot of the stuff that we do, according to Ecclesiastes, under the sun, dissipates very quickly. We get a, a little bit of excitement out of it, but it dissipates. People are looking for something that's burning, but yet it's enduring. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not draw near to this place. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Now, can I say something without being... I don't know what it's going to would it come across, but did you know I really believe that this is holy ground? 
I do. I don't just say that because I'd say that about every place. I, I really believe, sometimes while we're singing, I'm actually compelled to take my shoes off because in that moment, I really believe that I'm standing in some place sacred. That this is not just any other building, but that God has holy places with holy ground. Now, what does that mean, holy? It doesn't mean there's something mystical around it. It just means that right now, in this time, it's set apart. And it's set apart for a reason and set apart for a purpose. And what is it set apart for? So that I can build an altar and worship and praise and exalt the Lord. It's holy ground, right? It's not, this is not a strip center. It's not H-E-B, and it's not a parking lot. It is a place where we want to meet God. You know what I'm saying? That's what I want. I don't want it just to be a structure. I want it to be holy ground. I believe, and I said this before at the 30th anniversary, I believe it was holy ground because the guy in 1977 pastor lad when he was praying here he said god shined a light on this property and because back that was way before i came here but i believe god said from that moment on it's holy that he wants to use it he wants to use it for purpose and for something for him and i can honestly tell you it is more fascinating the hundreds of people that god has really touched because of it you know know on the back side of the desert Really? I mean, I think we get 20 cars a day that pass by here, okay? It's holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. I believe, I didn't go back and check, okay? I didn't go back and check. But I believe this is the first time that this title God uses for himself. I know there were times it was the God of Abraham and Isaac, because Jacob said that. But I believe this is the first time that God reveals himself as the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And so I thought about that. But let me give you two things that that came to me immediately. One thing for sure. God is a God of generations. Now, what do I mean by that? What he promises to one generation, he continues and fulfills in succeeding generations. See, I want to tell you something. In American churches like this, God makes a, a promise on Monday. We're hoping we get it by Friday, okay? But I am convinced, I am convinced that many of the promises that God has made me maybe will not be fulfilled in my lifetime, but because he is a God of generations, I'm believing they're going to be, begin to be fulfilled either in my kids or my grandkids. Why? Because he is not just the God of one generation, Abraham. He is a God of generations. Now here's what's so good, because I believe that I'm a fourth generation person and I believe that my granddad was given promises in fact I was in the room one day he here he was I don't know how old he was he may have been a 60 or 70s back then I can't remember but he was subjecting himself to prayer okay he went to go see someone to pray for him at the school I was at and I was in that room and I remember the guy prophesying over him declaring things over his life my granddad was a, a pastor but when I was listening to it I'm thinking, my gosh, the guy's only got maybe a few years left. Okay, and I'm listening, I'm thinking, well, okay. But see, he went ahead and passed away and went with the Lord. But see, that was before I got the idea that God promises generation to generation. He just spoke it to my grandfather, but it will be fulfilled in succeeding generations, okay? You you, that should encourage you, okay? Because it doesn't all have to be fulfilled with me. Aren't you excited if your kids get what you wanted anyway? I mean, isn't that what you, as, a, as a parent, does it make you jealous when your kids get more than you? No, it doesn't make you jealous. You want them to have more, right? I don't have much to hand them as far as financial. I don't want to get them discouraged here in search where they, they, you know, get all bummed out and can't receive anything. But what I do want, to, I do want to pass down God's promises, that's what I want to pass down. I say, God, be excited because God has promised things. Also, 
Abraham obviously is the picture of promise. He said the same thing to Isaac, and he also said the same thing to Jacob. So we could literally say this, what he's, what he's telling Moses. Moses, I am the God who makes promises and continues promises and keeps promises. Because that's what he's saying. Abraham was the, the first to get, be given the promise. Isaac was given the very same promise. Jacob was eventually given the same promise. So basically what God is saying is, I am the God who keeps promises and covenants as well. Amen? There's that. Let's keep moving. So Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, now this is what I wanted to, this is, this is the thing I want, I want you to get encouraged right here. This is it. This is not, it is not even profound, okay? I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. God sees and have heard their cry, God hears, because of their taskmasters, for I know God knows your sorrows. Now, do you hear what I'm saying? God sees, God hears, and he knows. You are not out of his sight. Even in captivity, where you may feel, does God even know I'm here? Does God even know what I'm going through? Does God even know what I'm experiencing? This text lets you know right now that your captivity was not only ordered by the Lord, but that God kept looking and hearing and knowing your situation. Amen? So whatever it is right now, that you're struggling with, whatever it is, he has heard the cry of your sorrow. Isn't that good? He's heard the cry. He is not absent. He is not far away. He is not unconcerned. He has been intimately acquainted with your situation. All I think he's looking for in this situation, not at all, because God acted totally sovereign here. There was no repentance necessary. There was no nothing necessary. All there was was groanings and crying out, and God heard their cry. Now look at this next statement that I think is over the top. So I came down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. Now isn't that good? I, like, I just wrote, I wrote, I underlined that. So I came down. Now let me tell you something. Well, just this is not deep or anything, okay? But when things are not that important to God, I think He just sends messengers. Go tell Mary, Gabe. Go tell this, Michael. You know what I'm saying? He sends messengers. But the groanings and the sorrows and the bondage of His people so moves His heart that He comes down Himself. You know what I'm saying? He's not contracting it out to other people or other beings. This is something that he himself wants to deal with himself and handle himself. Can I tell you something? That is exactly the way it was with Jesus, right? He didn't come in the burning bush. He came in flesh, right? Because God heard the cries of his people that this word of God became flesh and dwelt among us and began to liberate his people from their bondage, right? God himself said, I'm coming down. Now, let me tell you something. If that doesn't give you hope for freedom, I don't know what else would. He didn't say, now look, you guys read your Bible a little bit more and pray more. It's not what he said. He said, I've heard it. I've seen it. It has so concerned me that I'm going to come and handle it myself. That's encouraging, isn't it? And he said, I'm going to take you and I'm going to give them, I'm going to set them free, I'm going to take them out of, and I'm going to give them a land flowing with milk and honey. Now, I'm not going to focus on this just for a second, okay? But all God promised at this point was just a better life. That's all he's promising. But I'm going to tell you something. That's not why he set them free. He's not setting you free for a better life only. He's setting you free because he wants you to be free to become who you're called to be. See, what he eventually told them was, I want you to be a kingdom of priests 
before me. God was calling a people not to a better home, a better car, a better life. That was one of the fringe benefits of it. But what God was calling them to was a place before him as a kingdom of priests. God was wanting a people for himself to manifest himself, to express himself to the nations of the world. And Israel was chosen, or the Jews were chosen at that time to be that expression. It wasn't just to give them milk and honey. It was that they would become an expression of his grace and his glory to the nations. So God doesn't free you so you can go be a better employee only. God frees you so you can become what God wants you to be, right? It is freedom to become, not freedom to act any way you want. God really has a plan for you. That's my point. Are you with me? Oh, I want to be free so I can... No. God brings freedom so that you can be conformed to the image of His Son. There may be a fringe benefit of milk and honey, but that's not why He really set them free. God takes you out of some place so that he can do what? Bring you in some place. Are you with me? Then just free. Now I want to tell you something. So he goes, and there's a great story there, but I'm going to wrap this thing up. You know, Moses goes, you know the story, goes and tells Pharaoh, I love this part. He says, let what? You all know it. Let my people go. Right? Let my people go. I just, when I was meditating on that this morning, I kind of was saying it a little bit louder, Ben, I've got to be honest with you. <laughs> Let my people go. You know, I was all excited, okay? There you go. I declared it over Bastrop. I did. Let my people go. You know what I'm saying? I declare it. It's God's heart, isn't it? Okay, and so, but, but this is what kind of hit me. When it said that Christ descended and he led out a host of captives. You know what I'm saying? He's leading these out. Here's what I felt like. When he went down to wherever that down was, when he descended to the lower parts, I just, in my mind, I envisioned Jesus saying, let my people go because I've been given the keys of life in the grave. And I'm going to tell you something. Maybe at that time is when the earth shook and the mountains me you know, melted and, and the earth trembled at his work. Could you imagine what that would be like if Christ, when he descended down and said, let my people go? And it said he led out of there. It, I'm going to tell you something. It was so powerful. I, I, you know how many people don't even think about this? I think it's only in the Gospel of Matthew. It was so powerful that people that were in the grave came out of the grave and walked the streets of Jerusalem. Is that what it said? I didn't go back and read it. Okay. Just to, to say something, that is the scriptural basis for walking the dead, that movie. The Walking Dead. Okay? Y'all so just now getting it. Is it? No, I'm teasing. Okay. I just hope they didn't look like that. That would have scared the leaving bachibis out of me, right? I'm hoping when they came up out of the grave, they weren't like that, okay? That'd be scary. But my point is this. Whatever he said was so powerful when he defeated death and sin in the grave that people actually came up out of the grave and walked the streets of Jerusalem. So much so, I think this is what Paul meant when he said some people, in error that is, are preaching that the resurrection has already taken place because they may have been there and saw the graves open up and people walking the streets of Jerusalem. I'm going to tell you something. If I saw that, I might say the resurrection is taking place too. Honestly? But Paul was saying it's not there. It's even better than that. Better than that. Now I want to tell you something. When he did that, Pharaoh, now I'll end with this illustration. So you guys know the story, so I'm not gonna, I don't want to feel like i got to tell every part of it. But Pharaoh said this to him after a couple of judgments. He said, okay. He said, I'll let you go three days, and you can worship and make sacrifices. That's what Pharaoh said. Now look what he said. He said, I'm only going to let you go for three days, but you go. Y'all get out of here. And for three days, you guys go out there, you make sacrifices, you do what you need to do, and then we'll see you back home, okay? But see, I'm going to tell you something. That is just like the enemy, isn't it? You want to get free? 
God has told you you could be free, but what the enemy says to you is, you know what? You go to church, you worship, you go do that, you go to that conference, you go to that Bible study, you go to that home group, but I'm going to keep you next to me. Isn't that true? He, he'll, he'll allow you to do some things, but I'm going to tell you something. If it's not total victory, it will become your total defeat. Because the very thing that you do not allow God to liberate you from will become the very thing that pulls the rug right out from under you. Because that's what he told the children of Israel. The nations that you left there are the nations that are your undoing. When God is trying to bring you into freedom, the moment you say no to that freedom is the moment that your victory becomes your defeat. I'm just telling you. It's the way it works. You've got to be open to it. So, so don't, you know, maybe the enemy will allow you to go do some things, let you pray a little bit, let you read your Bible. But see, that's all a deception because that is falling short of what God wanted to do, and that was to open up the sea and take them into a wonderful land. And so people are really just happy about dabbling a little bit, thinking they found some kind of freedom. But until you've walked through the sea, right? Until you've seen your enemies swallowed up then there is no freedom because God wants to swallow your enemies. Amen? Amen? That's what he wants to do this morning. He wants to swallow some of your enemies. There is no greater taskmaster than sin. There is nothing that keeps you so beat down as your emotional problems and our mental areas and the things that the sin that so deeply affects our life and it, and it, and it just manifests itself in so many ugly ways. I already told you about jealousy, but anger and all of these things become very cruel taskmasters, don't they? Very cruel taskmasters. They suck the life. They keep you confined. They keep you oppressed. They keep you from ever experiencing the joys of life because they always stick their ugly head up like a serpent. Amen?